Praise God, the God of miracles. Wow. You still believe that he can do it? He literally said, if you ask anything in my name. <laughs> you know, sometimes we try to get our hands around those concepts and say, what are we missing? What are we missing? What are we missing? Praise God. God is so good. Amen. As Pastor mentioned on Sunday, him and his wife are at General Conference this week in St. Louis. It's the annual business meeting of the UPCI. They take care of all kinds of stuff there. Amen. We wish them well. We wish the business meeting well. And amen. To God be the glory. Um, before we get started tonight, I want to thank everyone for your prayers. Uh, the food that's been offered to my wife and I. Um, it's been greatly appreciated. Um, Mickey is healing. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who have visited her, it's like, you know, it's a good day and it's a bad day and it's up and it's down and no two days are the like. And, uh, you know, she's still wrestling with pain management and the nerves that are healing from this 15 inch incision all the way down her back. And so she's got, she's on a journey. I, I thought she might make it to church tonight, but uh, hopefully Sunday we'll see how that goes. Uh, I've got to tell this little story, you know, she had surgery, she was in the hospital for a week and then she was in rehab for eight days. This uh, Shirley Ryan, it's not even called rehabilitation, it's called the Ability Center. <laughs> it's the number one rated rehab facility in the entire country, it has been for 33 straight years. Amazing facility. And so they're not in doing occupational therapy and physical therapy, they want to make sure when you go home you can function, right, do the things you need to do to live. One of the sessions they had, they, they want to make sure you're mentally and kind of spiritually in the right place, you know, get your heads wrapped around this. She was the only one on her whole floor that could walk. Literally every, everyone else was in wheelchairs. And that's the type of facility it is. Um, and so there was a session there and it was called, it was, I was, the, the key word was strong or strength, you know. And so they're, they want to make sure these people are mentally capable of enduring what they're going through. Some of them have been there for months and they still can't walk. You know, they were spines broken and necks broken and they're, yeah, there's all kinds of things going on. And so they, you know, they had a little musician in there and do something and they get somebody else painting this and, and they had this exercise. They give everyone a rock and you had to paint this rock. <laughs> and on my mind, I'm going, <laughs> not my thing, right? <clears throat> but everyone had to paint a rock, something on this rock that symbolizes strength in them. And uh, I painted a, a smiling face with teeth on it. <laughs> That's me. Because I think a smile is so powerful. You can disarm people with a smile. I, and I said, look, I've, I've come from a small town relatively, and I come in this big city, and you walk down the street, and no one wants to look you in the eye. That's the way it is, right? It's getting that way here, more so, right? People are afraid to make eye contact with you. And I said, well, you know when you smile at somebody and look them in the eye and smile, it disarms them. They say automatically, I say, that person's all right. You know, I can trust them. But my wife, she painted on this rock about six or eight characters all holding hands. They were kind of stick-like figures. And she wrote on there, friendship. And she said, it's my friends and all the prayers that are going to get me through this. And when she said that, she broke down and cried. That's what it means to have friends and family. Don't ever forget that. Amen. Your prayers and your concerns are all greatly appreciated by my wife and I. We love you all. Praise God. Well, let's get on with the business at hand, the, the Word of God tonight. If you've got your Bibles, if you'd go to the Epistle of 1 John in the fourth chapter, probably some very familiar scriptures here. I think maybe I got a little different take on it. Hopefully you can glean something from the Word tonight, and I, I will attempt not to bore you. Praise God. 1 John chapter 4 and verses 17 through 19, and it says this, Herein is our love made perfect, 
that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. I, that little verse in there stopped me in my tracks. And we're going to come to it later. Because as he is, so are we in the world. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Verse 19, we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. Praise God. My message tonight is entitled, Casting Out Fear. Casting Out Fear. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight, but not like you love us. You have an everlasting love, an eternal love, an unfailing love, true love and perfect love. Help us tonight, dear God, to be more like you, to learn to love and trust. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Greet those quickly around about you. Amen. And you may find a place to sit. Amen. Glory, glory, glory. My hope tonight is to have an honest conversation about fear. <laughs> and I don't say that lightly. I think people are afraid to talk about what they're afraid of, right? <laughs> but I believe that uh, if we're all honest with ourselves, we all fear something, right? Now, I have several fears, I'm going to admit tonight. True confessions, right? I'm a little bit afraid of heights, which is called acrophobia. And it's not paralyzing in certain levels. Once I get up to a certain height, I can, I can usually adjust. <laughs> but when I get, I've been to Las Vegas, I've been in the, the CNN Tower in the Toronto, I've been in the top of that John Hancock building, and I've been on the edge of the Grand Canyon. When I get to the edge of something where it's dropping thousands of feet, I gotta step back, <laughs> truth be told, right? Now I'm also a claustrophobic, which is a fear of confined spaces. I, I'll tell you just a real quick story. I was, I was having some medical problems a, a year or so ago, and they wanted to run an MRI. I think it was what it was. And uh, they were going to do my head, right? And so you have to. <laughs> they want to put you in this tube, which I thought was pretty daunting all by itself. But they, because of what the tests are going to run me, they made me put this helmet on. They did not even get the helmet on me. And I said, no, 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 this is not going to work. You are not putting that on my head and then sticking me in that tube. I will come back another day. You've gotta, you either, you either got to give me some medications for this anxiety or you got to, they have open MRIs and, and I came back another time. I just, I could not handle that, right? <laughs> but fear is real and we all got to learn to deal with it. In every area of our life, if we're not careful, it has the potential to consume us. That's really the danger. Our scripture verse tonight says, fear has torment, right? And that's, that's a really difficulty for us if it can torment us, right? But there's both good fear and there's bad fear. There's both a godly fear and a worldly fear. It's kind of like good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, right? I don't know much about that stuff, but they always say, well, you, this good cholesterol should be this and your bad cholesterol should be that. And, you know, I'm not either one of them. But, but the term, the fear of the Lord, we're talking about good fear, that phrase all by itself appears 49 times in the King James Bible, 14 times alone in the book of Proverbs. This is a healthy reverence of a holy God in all that he represents. That's what the fear of the Lord is, right? Proverbs 1 and 7, none of these scriptures, I'm going to just blow through these. These are real quick. Proverbs 1 and 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 9 and 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 10 and 27, the fear of the Lord prolongs our life. Who doesn't want that, right? Proverbs 14 and 26, the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. That's a healthy fear. The fear of God, a respect for all that he represents and his word and his holiness and his righteousness and the truth, right? So we all understand there's a healthy fear of God, but that's not what I'm talking about tonight, right? So in preparation of this message, I did a little bit of research and homework to help put this message in perspective. The word faith is used 250 times, 258 times in the King James translation. 258, try to hold that thought there. The word love is used only, this surprised me, only 365 times in the King James Bible. But I always say, I gotta knew that fact earlier, convenient, one for every day of the year. I love that thought, right? But the word fear is used 546 times 
in the King James translation more than twice than the word faith. Now, to be fair and honest, I've always been taught that the Old Testament word for faith is trust, right? So I don't want to mislead you, obviously, right? So if you even add the 142 times that the word trust is in the Old Testament, regardless of physical context, right? It may have nothing to do with faith, but let's give them all, put them in that pile, between faith and trust. In New Testament, Old Testament, it's still only 400 times. And yet the word fear is used 546 times. And if you add the 232 times that the word afraid is used in the Bible, you get a whopping 778 uses for these words. Twice the word love is used and nearly twice as many as the word faith is used. So it's, it's a subject that the Bible deals with. We, we can't avoid it, right? So what are people really afraid of, right? I Googled, you know, you can find everything on the internet, right? We don't know if it's true or not, but you can find it. <laughs> so I Googled, well, what are people afraid of, right? You know, while these things pop up, right? One, one site said that the top five core fears of humans are the fear of death. We know that, right? How about the fear of abandonment? The fear of failure? The fear of a loss of identity, who I am, right? The fear of a loss of purpose in life. Those are pretty big items, right? I think they can affect all of us, right? Acrophobia, which is the fear of spiders, is, they claim, the most common phobia among people on one side. The fear of public speaking affects about 75% of all people, according to another site. So I ask you tonight, what are you afraid of? Have you ever even thought about it? Are you afraid of being lost? Are you afraid of the unknown? Are you afraid of your past? Are you afraid of the present? Afraid of the future, right? We're living in perilous times. Are you afraid of your sins? Are you afraid of the loss of your jobs or your income? Are you afraid of sickness or loneliness? Or loss of family members? What are you afraid of tonight? We could easily create a lengthy list of things that we might be afraid of at any level in our life, right? So fear at a certain level is natural and common to the natural man. Certain fears are natural, but I'm not even talking about any of those, right? those God-given orders. But I see, as says, new creatures in Christ, we ought to be changing. We ought to be in the process of being transformed, and we ought to be different than the world. That's what this message is all about. You know Romans 12 and verses 1 and 2 talks about the transforming and the renewing of our minds, right? God loves us the way we are when he finds us. But he doesn't want us to stay that way. He's in the business of breaking these chains and transforming and renewing us and making us into new creatures that we can be the salt and light, right? You stay the way you are and no one's going to be attracted to you. You would know nothing about me, most of you, nothing about me when I came out of the world. You would not love, love me, right? Trust me on that, right? And why do we got to renew our minds? Because our thoughts emanate from our minds. And our thoughts can lead to good things or bad things. We're going to find out pretty quickly, right? Now, I'm not going to give you chapter and verse, but you're probably familiar with many of the stories in the Gospels where even the apostles were fearful and afraid. As they crossed the sea in the midst of the storm when Jesus was sleeping, Lord, don't you care that we perish? The Bible says they were fearful. When they saw Jesus walking on the water in the middle of the night, they cried out in fear, the Bible says. The disciples were afraid when they followed Jesus into Jerusalem as he told them what was about to unfold there. They were very uncomfortable with that conversation. And the disciples were even afraid when they came to the tomb and found it empty. They were afraid. They didn't know what it meant. See, even these men who spent three and a half years with Jesus, men who saw all the miracles, who saw all the healings, the dead raised to life, were often charged with being afraid or being fearful. And I think that fact alone should give us some hope, right? Because <laughs> come on now, I'm trying to encourage each and every one of us. If they were fearful at times, there's nothing necessarily being ashamed of us being fearful at times, right? But we can't stay there. But watch this story of these 11 men as it unfolds in the book of Acts. Look at these 11 men 
post the day of Pentecost, post I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. It starts with these words in the second chapter of Acts, but we're not drunk as you suppose because it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. But that was just the beginning of this amazing transformation. They were bolder and they were fearless on that day. You don't see the word fear used in a derogatory manner against any of the apostles after the day of Pentecost. They maintained a healthy fear of God, good fear, good cholesterol, but it appears to me that they had lost their fear of men and circumstances. I believe that they had taken to heart the saying of Jesus who said in Matthew 10 and 28, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Something happened in these 11 men and many of the other disciples. Again, time is not going to permit me to go chapter and verse, but I'm going to suggest perhaps sometime this week, perhaps tonight when you go home, you read the fourth chapter of the book of Acts and see the transformation from fear to boldness unfold in these men. These same men who had abandoned Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in his hour of need just weeks before were truly transformed. The story begins in the third chapter, Book of Acts. It's the story of the lame man sitting at the gate called Beautiful, right? Peter and John walking by and he's begging alms, alms, alms and Peter reaches down and says, uh, silver and gold, I don't have any, but such as I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nathan to rise up and walk. And he gets up and he walks. <laughs> the whole temple, the whole temple is an uproar. And Peter and John boldly proclaim the glorious gospel of power by which this man was saved and healed that day. People were beginning to believe, and the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees were besides themselves by these events, and they take Peter and John into captivity and throw them in prison. The next day, they're asked to give an account of the chaos they caused in the temple that day, and Peter and John gladly obliged them. But the results were not what the priests and the Sadducees anticipated. Acts 4 and 13 says this. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, the writer of our scripture text tonight, 1 John, right? And perceived that they were unlearned. They didn't study. They didn't go to religious school. They didn't go to the seminary, right? They were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. <laughs> Now, when they eventually realized they could not intimidate them, nor they wouldn't prevail against Peter and John, they brought them back and said this. In Acts 4, verses 18 through 20, and they called them and they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. We forbid you. <laughs> but. Is the word but not one of the greatest words in the Bible? When you see the word but, something's changing Something didn't go according to plan, right? So sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Here it's but. Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it's right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, well, you judge us. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. <laughs> he said, you guys do what you're going to do. We're going to do what we're going to do. Where's the fear? He basically told them, look, you can do and say whatever you want, but we are going to continue to tell other people about this good news. Jesus Christ saves and heals as he did at the gate called Beautiful, right? There's no fear in these men. Now they're eventually released by the Jewish leaders and they report the events to the local assembly who immediately lifted up their voices in God. Acts chapter 4, we're still in chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. Listen. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant to thy servants with all boldness that they may speak the word. What a prayer this is. God, give us boldness. God, grant us boldness. Verse 30, by stretching forth thy hand. That's exactly what they did. That's all they did on that day. In boldness, they reached down and said, I believe. Rise up and walk, right? 
stretching forth thy hand to heal them, the signs and the wonders may be done by thy holy child Jesus. Oh, there's another prayer to make note of, right? Verse 31, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And perhaps if we weren't shaken by the things around about us, maybe the events around us would be shaken. <laughs> and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. No fear, no doubt, no apprehension. They dove in with both feet, right? It appears to me that the word fear was washed from their vocabulary when they began to exercise their faith post the day of Pentecost. Let's look at our text tonight. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. Now, I don't know about you, but the word boldness never comes to my mind standing in front of the throne of judgment. But here's John saying that you might have boldness in the day of judgment. John is exhorting us to perfect our love. Believe me when I say this is a process. It doesn't happen instantaneously. It didn't happen in the apostles overnight. It's an acquired jewel. And it goes all against our natural grain, everything that we are in the natural man. And why is John exhorting us to do this? So that we might have boldness like Peter and John in the temple. Boldness like Peter and John before the religious courts and boldness in the local assembly, right? Boldness in the day of judgment, unheard of. Unheard of. Why? So we could be more like Jesus. That's what it says. In the world, but not like the world. John continues his exhortation in verse 18, and he says... There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. I thought about this thing as I was studying this out and creating some comments to follow. There's enough meat in that one verse to feed an entire army. These verses and others Tie the knot between love and fear. I don't completely understand it, but follow me as I make a meager attempt to unravel the mystery. In John chapter 1, 1 John 1 and 4, it says, declares that God is love. Okay, so it starts with God and this perfect love, right? Let's hold that thought. Does God ever fear? (laughs) Is God ever surprised? Is God ever troubled by the events in your life and my life? I don't think he is. I don't think he ever will be, right? But the implication here is that his love, his perfect love, or perhaps maybe better, His perfecting love. See, we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. This process of getting our hearts and our minds around this concept that he loves us and it will never change. And because he loves me, nothing can happen to me because he wouldn't allow it to happen unless he was going to use it for some other good, right? It will deliver us from all fear. This verse says perfect love casts out fear. And we go to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of, here's again, power, love, and of love, and of sound mind. Note these four key words in here. Spirit, power, love, and mind. So many things going on in this single verse again, but the scriptures are again overcoming Fear with love. He's given us his spirit. We know about 1 Corinthians 3 and 16. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? So we, we know we have his spirit living in us, right? We got that base covered, which gives us power 
He said in Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you that you might be witnesses. This boldness that's going to come into our lives which establishes his love for us in verse 19 of our text because he first loved us which ultimately establishes a soundness of mind. When we get our mind wrapped around this concept that he loves me. A sound mind starts with a person who can control both their thoughts and their emotions. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 4 and 5. You know these verses, right? Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, right? Fear can be a stronghold. It can be a tormentor, right? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. See, both imaginations and thoughts are birthed in our mind, are they not? This is where the seeds are sown, right? And what's birthed in your mind eventually migrates to your heart. And what's planted in our heart soon enough comes out of our mouth. Matthew 12 and 34 says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You can't keep this stuff in you. Eventually it's going to come out. And you know what happens when things are spoken from the tongue? They lead to life and death. Not making it up. Proverbs 18 and 21. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. We've got to be so careful what we think. Because what we think will lead to things we say. And the things we say can become self-fulfilling. Self-fulfilling, right? I, I'm, I'm talking to my wife this week and she's, she's really... she's. I don't know, she's depressed, she's fearful, she's anxious about this process of healing and things aren't going along. And I said, Mickey, you've got to stop talking like that. This is a journey you're on. I'm just trying to encourage you. I'm not scolding you. But you've got to start saying positive things. Today's going to be better than it was yesterday. And tomorrow's going to be better than what today is. You've got to be careful what you say because you can dig yourself a hole. What comes out of our mouth can lead to life or death. We can literally speak things into existence that ought not to be. There are things we all know, but the challenge is to put them into practice, right? To bring our minds and our thoughts into captivity. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy, and that's what God wants and where he wants us to dwell. The, that says the kingdom is within you. The kingdom is within us. We have to be careful about what we think and what we say. So let's go back to verse 18 in our chapter in 1 John. Fear hath torment. And say, yeah, that's a real problem with fear. It torments us. It steals our peace. It robs us of our joy. It takes our eyes off God and puts all our thoughts on our problems. That's what's wrong with fear. If it's not godly. And the insidious parts that it happens so easily to each and every one of us. And so quickly... And none of us are exempt from the temptation to fear and fret about things that will never come to pass. That's the problem with fear. The things we worry about almost never come to pass. What about this and what about this and what about that? My experience is they almost never come to pass. And worrying about them, even if they did come to pass, never solved any of the problems that were related to them fears. Verse 18 says, he that fears is not made perfect in love. And that's the litmus test. Are we constantly in fear, fearful and afraid that our love isn't perfect? Yet. Yet. We've got some growing to do. We've got some maturing to do, right? God wants us to be like him. Didn't see him worrying about too much. <laughs> he, he was at such peace that he could sleep in the middle of the storm in, in a rocky boat now. <laughs> that says something. See, God loves us the way we are, but doesn't want us to stay there. So if fear is torment, then what are we, and if we're to bring every thought into captivity, what should we be doing with our minds? 
right? Some practical advice here. And I say train them. Train up your mind. See, the Bible has the answer to that question in almost every other question of life. Isn't it true? Let's go to Philippians 4 and 8. This verse was used, read during Brother Carl's celebration of life service so appropriately. Let's see what it says about good and godly thoughts. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Right before us all, think on these things, things that are true. Is there any torment in things that are true? I don't think so. Things that are honest, is there any torment there? Things that are just, is there any torment there? Things that are pure, things that are lovely, things that are good, things that are virtuous, things that bring praise to God. Is there any torment in any of those things? There is none. So the fact of the matter is we've got to control our thoughts to start thinking about good things, even when bad things are going on. Now, I'm not saying your house is on fire. Ignore the fire. <laughs> Put it out, please. But if you're fearful and afraid constantly, you've got to bring your thoughts into captivity. And say, I rebuke that spirit. I rebuke that fear. My God loves me with a perfect love. And I'm going to trust him. When you and I face uncertainty, when we face tragedy, when we face the unknown, when we face the darkness of this world, then more than ever we need to stop ourselves and consider where our thoughts are going to take us. And say, I refuse to go there today, devil. Amen. Get behind me. Will our thoughts lead us into the abyss of torment? Or will they lead us to the goodness of God? Those are the two choices we make, right? A thousand choices we make every day without even realizing it. Will we trust in ourselves? Our wisdom, our strength, our riches, our own abilities, and how sad that would be if we did? Or will we trust in the power and the strength of God to see us through that storm? In our text, John 4 and 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. And <laughs> love is the key. His perfect, unending, everlasting love is what can set us free from fear. See, his fear is perfect. His love is perfect, but ours isn't yet. But his desire is to be formed in us, us to put on Christ, right? That over time we would become more like him. That he would increase and I would decrease. And if love is truly the key to overcoming fear, maybe we should just stop for one minute and talk about that love. If you don't hear anything else that I said tonight, Romans 5 and 8 says, But God commendeth his love towards us, that while I was perfect, Christ died for me. No. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So let me ask you just a few questions tonight about his perfect love towards you and I. Where were you when Jesus found you? I, I, would, I want you to go back, whether it's six months ago, six years ago, or 48 years ago for me. Where were you when God found you? Number two, where were you when he found you? Remember where you were? And number three, what were you doing with your life when he found you? And then the last question, do you think it's even possible for him to love you less now than he did then.
You've got to answer that question for yourself. I say it's not even remotely possible. I'm not perfect, but I'm certainly not what I was when God found me. To God be the glory. I mentioned earlier, I'm getting ready to close, that the Bible has the answer to every question of life. I truly believe that. If you're looking for answers, there it is. On the subject of fearlessness, it's really the ability to trust God and his perfect love. <laughs> that it doesn't get bigger and smaller. I have three kids. They're not perfect. They frustrate me. A dark... Come on. Is my love ever, am I to love, is it even possible I'm in love to diminish my three beautiful daughters? And if, and if I wouldn't diminish my love for them, then how would God, with his perfect love, love you any less than he did when he found you? On the subject of fearlessness, there's no shortage of scriptures to draw on. I find the Psalms are particularly helpful in shedding light on the subject. <coughs> I could have went to the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. Verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shepherd, I would fear no evil, for thy rod and thy staff that comfort me. What a great psalm. I consider to go to Psalm 103. It's one of my favorite. I, I use this several times in funeral services because it's got it all for the person who lived for God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that was within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And it goes on for 22 verses to name all the benefits of living for God, the things that he does for us. I go there often when I need to be reminded of his goodness. I even considered Psalm 139, a beautiful 20-verse essay on how God knows us, sees us, how he made us and how he leads us. And be truthful, it doesn't get much better than that. But I eventually settled on Psalm 91. 15 verses of pure hope. Satan used them to <laughs> tempt Jesus after he had fasted 40 days at the beginning of his earthly ministry. But they offer so much for us tonight when we become fearful. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes while I read this and just see yourselves in this place. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Can you see it? I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust Remember Jesus saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks? That's what Jesus is thinking right now. His truth shall be your field, shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be fearful for the terror of the night, nor for the arrow that flies by the day nor for the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes in the noonday. Picture these next couple verses. A thousand shall fall by your side, and ten thousand by the right hand, but it shall not come nigh to you, because he loves you. 
We look around and we see all this world's disarray and wonder, what will I do? It doesn't matter if 10,000 around you die. His hand's on you. Only with thine eyes shall the behold and see the reward of the wicked. Some commentary I'll continue to read. It seems if the author here has just covered all the bases, the nighttime and the daytime and the darkness and high noon, this is what God's promised us today to keep us at all times. What shall I fear? Now listen as we finish the last verse, Aces. Last eight verses of the psalm, we begin to see why the whys of this relationship unfold. Verse 9, because you have made the Lord, because you have made the Lord your refuge, even the most high God, in thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh to thy dwelling place. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. You can tread upon the lion and the adder or the snake. The young lion and the dragon shall you trample under your feet. Why? Verse 14, because he has set his love upon you. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he knows my name. Verse 15, and you shall call upon me and I will hear you. I will be with you in trouble and I will deliver you and honor him with long life I will satisfy you and I will show him my salvation I will satisfy him and show him my salvation it's perfect love casts out all fear. It doesn't get any better than that. If we can all stand. God loves you. I can say I love you, but I don't love you like God loves you. I'm not going to pretend I do. I may think you're a stinker. I still love you. Not my God. Not my God. I hope I've encouraged someone tonight. I don't know what you're going through. Perilous times. Untoward generation. There's a lot to be fearful of out there. I, I say this to young, young marrieds with children. I'm sure glad I'm not raising my kids today. I pray for you guys every day. There's a lot to be fearful and afraid of. Mom. God's got you. God's got you. You just need to cast your cares upon him and let his perfect love cast away that fear. Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are great and greatly to be praised. There's no God like you, none beside thee, none above you, you love us with an everlasting love. Help us. Help us to receive that love. Help us to use that love to cast out all these fears, all these things that trouble us today. Help us to put them behind us. Trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not to our own understanding. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I bless you. You're dismissed.